Vin, thank you for the opportunity. It's truly an honor Good. to sit with you and talk with you. I've had the rare privilege of working with Vin over the last four years. Uh, there are very, very few people, less than you can count on one hand, who achieved the kind of success and, if I may say, the stardom that Vin has achieved. And it's extremely humble of him to take his time out and come all the way to Thai Detroit to be amongst you and share his story. And he's truly inspired by the energy and the excitement that Detroit has shown him in the last two days. Absolutely. Um, when, um, it's a great, like I said, it's a great success. Um, very few people reach the pinnacle that you have reached. Um, I want to take you back to your journey when you started uh, way back when you were an undergrad student at uh, Delhi Technological University. Um, the things haven't changed much, except that we have a lot more exposure, especially for students from around the world who want to come to India. So the yearning to come to U.S. hasn't died, subsided. It's still the same. But obviously, technology has leveled the playing field. What is your take when you look at young students, not only from India, but from around the world, who come to universities here aspiring to become professionals and then entrepreneurs? I think uh, clearly things have changed in terms of uh, opportunities a lot more today than they were when I came here uh, in 1975. Very few of us were coming and uh, it wasn't uh, that easy. Uh, and the, the reason I say it wasn't that easy is because, uh, for example, in my case, when I decided to come to USA, uh, my desire was to get a master's or PhD degree in solid state sciences because I had worked in semiconductor in Delhi for a couple of years and I got really exposed to this very exciting uh, technology and I thought I want to uh, learn more about it. But in order to figure out how to come to USA and where to go to university was a very complex process. Uh, back then, uh, fortunately, uh, not only that I was from Delhi, and Delhi has more of a hub of uh, U.S. Embassy, but U.S. had an uh, office called USIS, United States Information Services. I don't know whether it exists any longer or not. And this was in Lutyens, Delhi, a uh, nice office, typical American uh, place where fully air-conditioned, and some of us who are from middle-class Delhi, where we didn't have air conditioners at our home, it was a nice place to go squeeze yourself in. <laughs> and uh, go through their library and check out all the physical, uh, physical catalogs of various universities and what discipline, what offerings of courses, who the professors were, what their backgrounds were. So there was no Google, there was no Facebook, there was no place that you could just ask a question and get an answer like you do in uh, a variety of different uh, websites today in, uh, in, uh, in, 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 in today's world. So we had to physically go and look at this information, and you couldn't look at a lot of it, and then select and uh, end up applying and hopefully get here. This was a paradigm then. These days, I think anybody in India can just log in and find any information they want about any university here. And uh, basically, if they have the wherewithals and the intellect, they can be here. You then worked for a company called Continental Devices which was the only company working on chip design then. Um, I won't fast forward and come to a neighboring state from here, Ohio, because that's where you went to school, University of Cincinnati. Um, the amazing thing there was that you were so passionate about the technology uh, that made you take you to the ultimate destination, which was Intel. You said that you worked for a workshop to present and then Intel was there, and that's how you got hired. Mm -hmm. So share with a little bit of that particular episode. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll share with you a few things. Uh, I don't know whether there are people here who are from semiconductor field or understand what semiconductor chips are, uh, but those are really the, the heart and brain of everything that you carry in your pockets today. But they've gone into background because nobody really cares much about them. They are a highly complex machinery, which uh, is a, a chip may have about 256 steps in the process, may have about 50 layers of different materials laid on it, and uh, takes about 20, 30 days to put it all together, a single chip, 
and it doesn't come as a single chip. It comes on a plate we call wafer through which we dice uh, several small chips out of it for producing a lot of volume. And when I was uh, working in continental devices in India, we were making discrete semiconductors, but the process was the same. And every now and then, a whole lot, a lot is which what you process, will come out and won't yield. That is, everything you built is basically defective. And my frustration was that many times we would not be able to understand why it is defective. And that's what really led me to come to U.S. to, uh, in one of those occasions when I expressed my frustration to my boss, uh, who was uh, from Philips Semiconductor, had worked in uh, Netherlands for 14 years, and uh, he said, you really want to learn? I said, yeah. He said, then you need to go to the United States, and that's exactly what brought me here to get a degree in semiconductors. And in 75, when I came, uh, uh, the reason I picked University of Cincinnati among this other things was, A, they gave me free tuition and a scholarship. And on top of that, they had a, uh, f uh, a semiconductor lab, which basically was practically as advanced, if not more advanced, than the companies in India that were doing semiconductors, yes. just a lab in a university. And the reason for that was the university cannot afford to buy anything. These equipments are millions of dollars right. uh, expensive. But in U.S., being so advanced, there are other companies like NCR or RCA back then, when they would advance to the next generation of technology, they'll take all of their old equipment, which is basically trash, and give it to the campus. And we at university, we don't care about being on the state of the art, leading edge, producing you know, cost effective devices. We just want to do research. For us, that was a perfect setup. So that was the reason why I came to uh, Cincinnati. And, uh, Working at NCR was a very interesting uh, experience for me because after I came here, I was enrolled in PhD, and after being here for about a year and a half, I realized what a beautiful life one can have in this country if you have money. And I was only making $350 or so, and uh, that led me to really quit my uh, desire to finish my PhD and just do my master's. And the quid pro quo I had with my advisor, who was quite upset about this change of mind that I had, because he had already, uh, I guess, uh, taken some funding from yeah. NASA to do some research that would have now been affected by my absence. Uh, he was initially very uh, upset about it, but then he came to me one day and said, look, um, one of our uh, partners, NCR, who gives us hundreds of millions of dollars worth of money, uh, is in need of an experienced person, and we looked through the entire run-up of all the graduate and postgraduate students, you are the most experienced. If you were to simply go down to Dayton and interview with them, just for doing that, I will allow you to go ahead and just finish your master's and give you a good recommendation. So this was a, a very selfish motive, and I do remember that I didn't have a car, so my next question to him was, okay, then how do I get to Dayton? And he actually drove me. So this is how kind and generous people are in this country. That was my experience. And uh, at the end of the day of the interview, I was offered a job. And all I remembered was when I came to this country, uh, there were five or six students in University of Cincinnati in the, from India. And they were all senior to me. And they were all, quote, unquote, hanging around. And I asked them, why are you hanging around? And they said, well, there's a thing called recession. I didn't know what recession was. And there was no Google back then. So I had to go literally look up a dictionary. And, see what recession means, because coming from India, I, you know, India never had recession, or maybe it was always in recession right. for all, you know. And, but we never used that terminology. So that was stuck in my mind, that the country is in recession, there are no jobs, my friends are all taking more degrees and more courses and getting more PhDs. I don't want to do any of that, so this is a job they're offering, might as well take it, and I took it. Because as most of you know, when you come here from India as a student, First thing is you have to get a proper uh, labor certification and job and, you know, on your way to a green card. So that's my story of NCR. But luckily for me, NCR at that time, by, by the way, was uh, Intel of uh, point of sale terminals, 80-90% market in the world. And they were going from mechanical cash registers to electronics. Mm -hmm. And they were wanting to do some research in uh, what we call non-volatile memories. These are devices that don't forget what you stored in them, which, by the way, all of you use today in your iPhones without thinking about. 
and I'm one of the co-inventors of that. Um, so that was my project, working with a Bell Labs, uh, uh, ex-Bell Labs researcher, a Canadian, um, who taught me everything about how to do research. Um, and we created something very original, which uh, got a publication in IEEE. We were invited to present in Monterey in California. Uh, he said he was too busy. He asked me to go present, and I did. And uh, as luck would have it, Intel was in the audience, and Intel just loved what we were doing, and they hired me into Intel. What a story. Uh, it's still inspiration for all of us. Um, Intel was and um, still is predominant uh, in microprocessors. So they had the 386 and the 486, and the next advanced version was the 586. And that's where you came into the picture, leading a, a very dedicated team. Uh, that's where I think we and the world found Vinod Dham as the father of the Pentium chip. So it's interesting to share that part of the story of how 586 became Intel and Pentium inside. Yeah, I mean, again, uh, I look back and I feel like, you know, you have to take responsibility for your own job and your own livelihood in this world. And I was a technologist, uh, a physicist by interest and passion, and creating this, uh, co-inventing the flash technology, which is what, uh, like I said, is all the iPhones have, where you keep all your photos and you're able to delete them and change them today. And I had this feeling that I want to get out of R&D and do, uh, get exposed to business. And I remember um, talking to uh, the microprocessor division head at Intel at that time to give me a job. And it turned out he didn't have a job for me. Even though I was ranked and rated very high in Intel terminology, that means you are really good. He just didn't have any opening for me. Um, I was quite uh, disappointed and thought maybe I should leave Intel and go look for a job elsewhere. But accidentally, in one of the days when I was sitting in the cafeteria, uh, close to some people, I overheard them saying that the 386, which was already designed, it was the first Intel 32-bit microprocessor, was having a hard time yield more than half a die per wafer. You know, so in a wafer, there are 56 locations. This was a six-inch wafer. You're supposed to get at least 40 of them working. They were getting only half working. And uh, it was a lot of frustration. I dug deep into it. I realized that the company was uh, seriously um, uh, thinking they might default uh, with Compaq and supplying this chip. Nobody knew outside how desperate the situation was in inside. And Andy Grove had just uh, appointed a task force under Craig Barrett, who went on to become CEO and chairman of Intel. And Craig assembled a team of 10 or 12 people, including the head of microprocessor group who had rejected me for a job. And uh, when I learned that, I had this instinct of why there's a problem and where is this problem. Because of my background of, from technology and physics and also from design. Mm -hmm. And most of these people who were trying to fix this problem were only from design. So I actually volunteered back to him saying, hey, I understand you are in trouble. He said, yeah. And I said, I think I can help you. He says, how? I said, let me just come work with you. You don't need to reorganize your team. You don't need to give me a job that will upset other people. Just appoint me as an individual contributor, as we called it at Intel. And I will go solve this problem, which I did. And the rest is history, you know. And I got into be seen by Andy Grove, Gordon Moore, and everybody else as somebody important. And they gave me opportunities to work on chips like Pentium. Um, you also uh, hold, obviously, with the rest of the world, uh, Andy Grove in very high regard. And there is a very important leadership lesson he taught you. Well, about he how taught to be me many leader. lessons. Which one? <laughs> about the, being a good leader. No, I, I mean, they, they were, I don't know where to start from. Uh, he truly was an engineer who became a manager, and then he managed like an engineer by quantifying everything. Uh, was empowering the people in your team and not trying to micromanage the team and let them thrive. Yeah, no, that, 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 that definitely was always the case at Intel where, you know, it was part of the culture. Intel had a culture and uh, the culture had five values. Uh, there was a value of uh, risk orientation, result orientation, customer orientation, quality orientation, and a great place to work. The last one was last in the place. No, it wasn't a great place to work. 
It was a great place to work for people who really enjoyed working there, otherwise it was like a sweat house. Uh, but if you were managing the first one right, that is results orientation, that is you were really advancing the bottom line of the company, you were a hero. But I think the leadership that he had was, I think, as you know, he uh, wrote a book called Only the Paranoid Survive. And even when Intel was the most successful company in the world, he was always acting as if it's a company that's going out of business. So inside there was always turmoil, inside there was always uh, a feeling of that we are not doing enough. Uh, Pentium was the same way. Um, it's a chip that would have required us, you know, four years to do, and he wanted to get it done in two years. It's a chip that would have required not to get the kind of parameters that uh, he was asking for. He was always asking for the moon. So ridiculous sometimes that you would sit there and look at him and say, it's impossible. And he would say, go, go, get it done. And mostly I realized that actually two-thirds of the way I would be able to get there even uh, with what he had asked me to do. So that was really a leadership thing too that I learned that you can stretch yourself, you can push yourself, you think differently when you're asked to think out of the box. Uh, there, there are many other cases uh, that I can go into, but maybe yeah. we should save some time. Um, there was the zenith of your professional career, and you were in your mid-40s, and being in Silicon Valley, I think all of us have this bug that we want to be, and we should be, uh, in, in a startup. You know, either you should have started a startup or be part of a startup. And the same bug caught on to you, and you wanted to be an entrepreneur, and then NextGen came along. That was a boutique firm that was again working on uh, similar technology as Intel. And NextGen then eventually got acquired by AMD. And then you went to the opposition and created the K6 processor, which was the killer processor for Intel. So that's the other part we want to learn from you. No, I think uh, the unsaid part of the story is I come from a very conservative background. <laughs> My father was a civilian in Indian Army and he retired in one job all his life. Most of my brothers have worked in the same job all their lives. So for me to really leave Intel at the peak of my career with all that I had accomplished was not an easy job. And, uh, but what triggered it, I think, was not as much as that I wanted to be in a startup, which I definitely wanted to and would always wonder if I would stay with Intel, then I would never get that opportunity. But more importantly, just about the time we had uh, launched Pentium and it had taken off in the market. Um, internally, it was known that Andy Grove was grooming Tech Barrett to become the new CEO. So the, we had a very clear line of who's coming next. And he was already chief operating officer. And he was my mentor because he was the head of the task force where I had done my magic. So he had a very special affinity uh, for me. And I remember him coming in. Uh, sitting down with me in a confidential room and telling me, look, I'm going to be the boss, I'm going to call the shots, and you're going to be my favorite man. But here's one clinch that we have decided to reorganize the company and make it like Compaq Computers. Compaq Computers was one of our biggest yeah. customers at that time in Houston, and they had what they uh, call uh, a desktop division, a server division, and a laptop division. So we used to make a chip that will go into all these different machines. And when I would go to Houston, I would be able to spend one day with one, one day with one, one day with the other, and learn a lot talking to the customers that I enjoyed, um, and then going back to my drawing board and building a chip somewhat tweaked for each one of them. But he said that what we're going to do is now we're going to parallel an organization inside Intel which will be just like them. We will have a laptop division in Intel, a desktop division, and a server division. So you, you are the first person I'm talking to when you pick whichever you want, and you can be head of that. And I said, well, that's very good, but what about who is going to be doing the development? He said, well, that will be someone else. And I didn't like that. I said, I want to do the product development, and I also want to do the, the business side of it. He said, but that we, will, we, we have to break that. Right. We have to keep product development in one location and business in the other. And that really triggered my thought, and I said, this is time to leave, <laughs> and I left. Uh, these are tough taskmasters, and I have to keep up with the time. It's an interesting journey. I'm sure we can all sit for another hour and listen. But for, to catch up with the time, I just want to run forward with your story. Um, NextGen, like I said, was acquired by 
AMD and then uh, you helped three guys from MIT who came with an idea for a company called Silicon Spice and you completely turned it around, made it a VOIP chip and that was then acquired by Broadcom for $1.2 billion. So that after that successful exit, um, you created a fund um, which was probably one of the first fund going into India New Path Ventures. Uh, and then the second fund was, of course, India-US Venture Partners. So we'll spend a few minutes on the point of entry into India in about 2006 time, when in India was just coming up into entrepreneurial ecosystem, e-commerce was just raising, and you had some great investments. Uh, we just want to spend some time on that. Yeah, no, I think actually after selling Silicon Spice in 2001, it took a year or so off, I built a home for myself, and then I asked myself, what do I want to do next? And really what came back was, I need to go get back to India. Because I went to Delhi College of Engineering, not Delhi Technology University. That's a new name My these apologies. days. Yeah. No, no, it's the same. The university, they have become a university rather than an engineering college. Uh, but I still affiliate myself with engineering college. Uh, the fee, I think, uh, they were charging at that time was equivalent of $2 per month in today's rate. And even that would come back if you're in the top 10% of the merit class, that money will be returned back to you. So can you imagine becoming an engineer with $2 a month anywhere in the world? So I really owed a big way back to India. And I went and met with the Seem Premji. There's somebody from uh, Wipro here today I met, and with Narayan Murthy and people like that to say, what do you think I should do? And most of them said you should do what you're good at, which is chip design. And so I basically went back and did a New Path Ventures in 2002, before anybody from America had even thought of going to India. But I set it up as incubator where I did R&D in India and marketing and sales here. Sure. But it was in 2005 that I thought I should do a full-fledged fund, invest in India with the aim that uh, if we could create a few millionaires, billionaires in India through venture capital, through startup entrepreneurship activity, it will take its own uh, form which is what exactly happened. Uh, right. We were four or five of us who went there. Today, India is booming with venture capital, startup, entrepreneurship, and things of that nature. Yeah. And that was one of the dreams I had, and I'm glad that it went there. Yeah, right I way. just want to mention two very successful companies, Snapdeal and Mintra, which were really huge. Yes. And that was you're the, one of the first early investors in those yes. companies. Yes. So been coming uh, to the conclusion now is uh, you are a big fan of AI. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity you see in that space. Uh, you also started another company in the education sector. Um, so I wanted to ask you, where do you see the next wave of entrepreneurship? And uh, like I said, uh, global connectivity is the new mantra. So AI and connectivity and all that. So you I mean, the, the, the bottom line is, I, I started this education company, which was my uh, passion, about three, four years ago. Now it's taken up by Manipal colleges in India with a huge investment and they are pursuing it further. But I started that company fundamentally sitting at my home, doing all the reading uh, through Google, uh, finding out everything about uh, what's going on in online learning. I signed up on MOOCs, I took classes at MIT, I took classes at Harvard, I went on Coursera, I took Udacity. I sit, sat at my home in my pajamas at my own leisure, learned all the things that were going on, found all the negative defects in them, and f really had a passion about doing it a certain way. Then I wanted to really do it in a low-cost manner, so I wanted to go back to India. I wanted to find somebody who could partner with me. I went on LinkedIn, and I found a guy, and I contacted him because he had done a company called Tutor Vista, which had been successful, which was along the lines that I was thinking about, all the this he had done for junior high school and high school. And it turned out that uh, he was from my college, and he was delighted to have met, and we both started the company. So I'm just giving an example how you can literally start companies today sitting at home with practically no cost. And of course, we both shelled out for about first year money from our pocket to build up the team, but then we got a lot of VCs to come in, and now there's a huge uh, corporate that has come in to take over the company and uh, move forward. And uh, something similar I'm doing with the AI, the interest in AI is, I think if microprocessors were the inflection point and that created PC, the next inflection point was internet that created ability for us to all connect in the world, I would give the next 
inflection point to Steve Jobs for the smartphone because he's allowed us to be connected even when we are mobile, not just tied into our desktops, our homes. The next one is AI. And it's going to be permeating in every aspect of everything we are going to be doing. And just like uh, the, the, one of the uh, fathers of deep learning, Andrew, he's a professor at uh, Stanford, he calls it the new electricity. And just like electricity is everywhere and you can't live without it, AI will be everywhere. So I've taken a part of it and uh, I believe that uh, you can create chips that will be creating better intelligence than the way it's being done just with the software today. I'll leave it at that. Uh, Anu, do we have uh, time for a couple of questions? Yes, please. Uh, we'll take a couple of questions. Please raise your hand. I can not see anybody at all because <laughs> they have these yeah. flood lights. Could we have the lights, to please? Blind thank us. you. So, yes. Uh, th thank you, uh, you know, the, for sharing your uh, experience, you know, uh, early on that we, we can also share, you know, how we uh, researched uh, universities to come over here, you know, without Google and all such, such kind of things. And uh, what about uh, the Moore's Law, you know, do you still uh, believe that Moore's Law uh, keep up its uh, uh, rate at, uh, you know, every 18 months uh, the computing power doubles? Uh, what, what, what do you, uh, what's your uh, thought on that? Yeah, no, I think the, the Moore's Law, as most of you know, Gordon Moore, the founder of Intel, one of the greatest men I have ever met in my entire life and worked with, uh, he's still alive by the way, gladfully. Uh, he made an observation in 1965 and his observation was based on three, four years that he had worked in a company called Fairchild Semiconductors where he was a director of R&D and his observation was that every 18 months the number of transistors, these are small devices you can put on a chip, doubles. And he merely just plotted a graph and he kept on plotting it and to date he's still plotting it and uh, I had the honor of making two plots on that curve. One was 486 and one was Pentium. Uh, and what that law says is you could exponentially keep on doubling the density of the devices and improve their performance over the last 40 years. And so we kept on shrinking the dimensions with which we could define the transistors and we could make them smaller and smaller. But I must tell you even though we've been calling it for last 15, 20 years, it's coming to an end, it came coming to an end, but it actually is coming to an end, finally, because the dimensions have become so small that they are at atomic levels, that they're interfering with the size of atoms that are uh, deposited on the uh, silicon in the form of oxide. So at that point, you, n even God cannot save you unless you know you, God and physics are the same. So we are really running into a situation where at about five nanometer, uh, it's coming to halt. And by the way, that's why you see, if you see um, Broadcom buying Qualcomm for $90 billion and Qualcomm buying uh, NXP, which is uh, Philips Semiconductor for $39 billion and Mayoshi San buying ARM for $39 billion. You know, these are huge numbers. This has never happened in semiconductors before. In last two years, there have been many M&As. And the reason is, industry, only way it can survive going forward is just like a potato chip industry. You have to have economies of scale, you have to consolidate and make money out of doing that rather than progressing technology at a fast speed and growing much faster than that. So that's what's happening with Moore's Law today. There's one gentleman here. Oh, you're there, sorry. Thank, thank you, Vinod. If you wouldn't mind, would you please uh, expand on some companies that you may think are worth looking at uh, that are having success and uh, traction in AI? You know, AI is very nascent and uh, honestly the, uh, the winners and losers are going to shake out over the next five years in my opinion there are about 1,000 companies that have been funded in the last uh, just a couple of three years in a variety of fields. And I have been more focused on companies in the semiconductor area, people who will build chips that can accelerate the uh, deep learning mechanisms, the neural networks, you know, and how do we really process uh, and train these brains to get the outcomes that we are expecting. Uh, there are a handful of very well-funded and extremely uh, 
staffed by who's who in the world companies, and I, I can uh, on the offline share some of the names with you. But I think uh, still the winners and losers are not yet shaken down. There's only one big winner. It's a public company called NVIDIA, which uh, has used its gaming chip that they built uh, many years ago. Uh, when Silicon Spice was started, uh, Jen Suong started his company. He, and he's pivoted his company into AI for deep learning. And the stock has gone from $20 to, I think, $180 in the last two, three years. And that's a public way of really participating. And I think they, they will continue to be hot until someone comes out and displaces them. And I hope that's me. <laughs> the note? Yes. Uh, right in the center. No. I cannot yeah. see you, please. Thank yeah. you. Yes, go ahead. Uh, now that the Moore's Law is coming to its terminal conclusion, what do you think about quantum computing? You know, I must say I am a novice in quantum computing. I've been basically trying to read like most of you and trying to keep up with it. Uh, I'm very uh, delighted that uh, Microsoft particularly and uh, Intel have joined IBM. These are three companies that I know of who are pursuing uh, quantum computing uh, R&D inside. But I must tell you that everything I've read so far, I am not very encouraged by it. And this reminds me of, you know, a uh, few years ago they had carbon nanotubes and they were going to go to carbon as the next mechanism for doing it. And IBM did a lot of research and actually even built a few products and few chips. But you key about semiconductors is, by the way, there are two billion transistors on a single chip today that's being produced. Two billion transistors. And the, the, the amount of interconnect on that, which is the size of my thumbnail, if you were to follow it together, it could be many kilometers. Many kilometers of wiring is just on the size of my thumbnail. If you can just even imagine in your mind's eye how small and thin that must be. The thing about semiconductors is, and that's, that's what Gordon Moore, my big boss, used to say, that nature created something uh, in terms of silicon, which is a material in chemical periodic table, and you lay oxide on it, which is called silicon dioxide. And they two are so stable that no other two materials in chemical periodic table, gallium, arsenide, phosphide, carbon, we have tried so much. You can imagine. We live in America, right? There are people who have billions of dollars. They have tried every permutation combination possible. It doesn't work. These two materials seem to be God's, <laughs> nature's uh, gift to us as humankind, where we got the stability and we were able to propagate it for 40, 50 years and keep on making it smaller. But unfortunately, we run out of that in that physics. Hopefully, we'll create something new, but I don't see anything very promising on the horizon just in time to take the baton off of silicon and move on to this quantum or whatever the next thing is going to be. So this will be a very interesting paradigm where, for a period of time, we will have to live with what we have, and uh, that's not very pleasant. Thank you for sharing your story with us, Vinod. I have a personal question. I see a man that's extremely humble and confident at the same time. Can you share where that comes from? I have no idea where that <laughs> comes from. Uh, I really have no idea where that comes from. I think you're born a certain way, and uh, you know I do believe that each person has their own uh, personality, and uh, the key is to be able to know your strength and build upon your strength and your passion and go in life, and hopefully you'll see good results from that. Anu, are we done? Yes. Okay. I'll take this opportunity uh, to share another uh, anecdote. Vin mentioned that he studied with $2. There is a whole generation that came to U.S. with $8. Because that is how much the Indian government allowed us foreign exchange at the time. So all these people uh, who came, and most of them have achieved tremendous success, remain grounded, remain humble, and Vin is a personification of that. It is, uh, again, my privilege and a great opportunity for all of us to be here and to listen and get mesmerized with your amazing success and amazing journey. Thank you so much, Wen, for Thank the you. opportunity. Thank you very much.